the first year students. Welcome to the eighth lecture on the subject English literature. The theme of the lecture is the subjects of Shakespeare's historical chronicles and his sonnets. Objectives. By the end of the lecture, students should be able to acquaint with William Shakespeare's well-known historical chronicles, define the idea of his chronicles, identify what is a sonnet and main themes of Shakespeare's sonnets. According to the plan of the lecture, the following questions will be discussed. The first, historical chronicle and its definition. The second, Shakespeare's histories and their common features. The third, definition of a sonnet and its characteristics. And the last question, does Shakespeare and sonnets? Chronicle, a usually continuous historical account of events arranged in order of time without analysis or interpretation. Examples of such accounts date from Greek and Roman times, but the best-known chronicles were written or compiled in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. These were composed in prose or verse, and in addition to providing valuable information about the period they covered, they were used as sources by William Shakespeare and the other playwrights. Examples include the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Geoffrey of Manmore's Historia Regum Britannia, History of the Kings of Britain, Andrew of Winetown's Original Chronicle, and Raphael Holyshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The word is from the Middle English Chronicle, which is thought to have been ultimately derived from the Greek chronos, which means time. Chronicles create a timeline of events which is implicitly important in both storytelling and historical writing. They are more comprehensive than a simple timeline as they provide details and information about events rather than just the time and order in which they happened. Chronicles help to recover the histories of all aspects of human life – politics, religion, weather, law, fashion, language – nearly any topic can be chronicled. Furthermore, the way in which chronicles report information is objective, orderly, and accurate, and therefore reliable. In a chronicle, the plot is impelled forward by the irreversible and overwhelming much of time which dominates the actions and lives of the characters. The use of the historical chronicle in literature began during the Renaissance owing to the emerge of the issues of man's relationship to time. The concept of time was replacing the classical concept of faith and the medieval concept of God. The new concept of time retained the superpersonal and omnipotent aspects of earlier two concepts that had no innovative worldly aspects as well. An early example of the use of the historical chronicle in literature was Shakespeare's use of Holy Shell's Chronicles of England, Scotland D and Ireland D in several plays. The romantic uh, chronicles of Mary Me and A. de Vigny were based on the romantic concept of the spirit of the time and of the individuality of each historical epoch. William Shakespeare tries to raise historical consciousness and indoctrinates the importance of order and degree and obedience to kingship in his histories. He emphasizes the importance of divine rights of kingdom, passive obedience, and the maxim the king do not wrong in his place. He wants both the audience and their rulers against the destructive effects of disobedience which leads to chaos and civil war in the society. Shakespeare pulled inspiration for his plays from a number of sources, but most of the English history plays are based on Raphael Holyshed's chronicles. Shakespeare was known for borrowing heavily from early writers and he was not alone in this. Holyshed's works published in 1577 and 1587 were key references for Shakespeare and his contemporaries, including Christopher Marlowe. Common features of the Shakespeare histories the Shakespeare's histories share a number of things in common. First, most are set in times of medieval English history. The Shakespeare's histories dramatize the Hundred Years' War with France, giving us the Henry Tetralogy, Richard II, Richard III, and King John, many of which feature the same characters at different ages. Second, in all his histories, Shakespeare provides social commentary through his characters and plots. Really, the history plays says more about Shakespeare's own time than the medieval society in which they are set. For example, Shakespeare cast King Henry V as the everyman hero to exploit the growing sense of patriotism in England. Yet his description of this character is not necessarily historically accurate. 
This not much evidence that Henry V had the rebellious youth that Shakespeare depicts, but the bard wrote him that way to make his desired commentary. It wasn't Shakespeare, but Shakespearean scholars who categorized his plays into the areas of tragedy, comedy, and history. The plays normally referred to as Shakespeare history plays are the 10 plays that cover English history from the 12th to the 16th centuries, the 1399 to 1485 period in particular. Each historical play is, in, is named after and focuses on the reigning monarch of the period. In chronological order of setting, Shakespeare's historical plays are King John, Richard II, Henry IV, Part I, Henry IV, Part II, Henry V, Henry VI, Part I, Henry VI, Part II, Henry VI, Part III, Richard III, and Henry VIII. The plays dramatize five generations of medieval power struggles. For the most part, they depict the Hundred Years' War with France from Henry V to Joan of Arc and the Wars of the Roses between York and Lancaster. Shakespeare was a keen reader of history and was always looking for the dramatic impact of historical characters and events as he read. Today we tend to think of those historical figures in the way Shakespeare presented them. For example, we think of Richard III as an evil man and the kind of psychopath with a deformed body and a dodge against humanity. Henry V's knee, Prince Hall, is the perfect model of kingship after an education gained by indulgence in a misspent youth and a perfect human being, but that is only because that's the way Shakespeare chose to present him in the furtherance of the themes he wanted to develop and the dramatic story he wanted to tell. In fact, the popular perception of medieval history as seen through the rulers of the period is pure Shakespeare. Uh, as for his historical plays, the first one is Henry IV, Part I. While his son Prince Hall spent time in the tra taverns, King Henry IV argues with his former ally, Hotspur. Angry, Hotspur gathers a rebellion and Henry and Hall go to battle to stop him. Henry's army wins the battle, while Hall redeems himself from his wild youth and kills Hotspur. Henry IV Part II is about the burden of power, old age and atonement for the past of King Henry dies and Prince Hall accepts the crown. The play begins in the aftermath of the battle in Shrewsbury. In despair at the death of his son Hotspur, the Earl of Northumberland pledged to lend his support to a second rebellion. This uprising is led by Richard Scroop, who is the Archbishop of York. Henry V. After an insult from the French Dauphin, King Henry V of England invades France to claim the throne he believes should be his. Henry stops an assassination plot, gives powerful speeches, and wins battles against the odds. In the end, he woos and marries the Princess of France, linking the two nations. Henry VI, Part I. After Henry V's death and while Henry VI is young, nobles rule England and fight the French, including Joan of Arc. As Henry VI becomes king, the noble houses begin to divide and take sides between York and Lancaster. Henry VI Part II Against the wishes of the nobles, King Henry marries the penniless Margaret, who plots against him with her lover. As tensions between York and Lancaster built, the Duke of York gathers supporters for his claim to the throne. York secretly leads a rebellion. His supporters proclaim him king and Henry is forced to flee. Henry VI Part Three. After York's claims to the throne, Henry changes the succession and makes York his heir, disinheriting his own son. Henry's queen kills York and York's son Edward seizes the throne. Henry is imprisoned several times and eventually killed by King Edward's brother Richard. Richard III is a play about evil and violence and murder. It charts the rise of Richard, Duke of Gloucester, a cold-blooded and distantly villain who slots his family and even marries his victim's widow to become king. A sonnet is a one stanza, fourteen line poem written in iambic pentameter. The sonnet, which derived from the Italian word sonetta, meaning a little sound or song, is a popular classical form that has compelled poets for centuries. The most common and simplest type is known as the English or Shakespearean sonnet, but there are several other types. 
Before William Shakespeare's day, the word sonnet could be applied to any short lyric poem. In Renaissance Italy and then in Elizabethan England, the sonnet became a fixed poetic form, consisting of 14 lines, usually iambic pentameter in English. Different types of sonnets involved in the different languages of the poets writing them, with variations in rhyme scheme and metrical pattern. But all sonnets have a two-part thematic structure containing a problem and solution, question and answer, or proposition or interpretation within their 14 lines and a volta or turn between the two parts. Sonnets share these characteristics. 14 lines. All sonnets have 14 lines which can be broken down into four sections called quatrains. A strict rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme of a Shakespearean sonnet, for example, is A B A B C D C D E F E F G G, written in iambic pentameter. Sonnets are written in iambic pentameter, a poetic meter with 10 beats per line, made up alternating unstressed and stressed syllables. A sonnet can be broken into four sections called quatrains. The first three quatrains contain four lines each and use an alternating rhyme scheme. The final quatrain consists of just two lines, which both rhyme. Each quatrain should progress in poem as follows. The first, first quatrain. This should be established the subject of the sonnet. Number of lines for rhyme scheme A, B, A, B. The second, second quatrain. This should develop the sonnet's theme. Number of lines for rhyme scheme C, D, C, D. The third, third quatrain. This should round off the sonnet's theme. Number of lines for rhyme scheme E F E F. And the fourth, fourth quatrain. This should act as a conclusion to the sonnet. Number of lines to rhyme scheme G G. The Shakespearean sonnet. The most well known and important sonnets in the English language were written by Shakespeare. These sonnets cover much themes as love, jealousy, beauty, infidelity, the passage of time and death. The first 126 sonnets are addressed to a young man while the last 28 are addressed to a woman. The sonnets are constructed with three quatrains, four line stanzas and one couplet, two lines in the meter of iambic pentameter, like his place. By the third couplet, the sonnets usually take a turn and the poet comes to some kind of epiphany or teaches the reader a lesson of some sort. Of the 154 sonnets Shakespeare wrote, a few stand out. The collection of 154 sonnets remains some of the most important poems ever written in the English language. The list is broken down into three sections. The Fair Youth Sonnets dark lady sonnets and the so-called Greek sonnets. Indeed, the collections contain sonnet 18, shall I compare thee to a summer day, described by many critics as the most romantic poem ever written. It is strange that, considering their literary importance, they were never supposed to be published. For Shakespeare, the sonnet was a private form of expression. Unlike his plays, which were written expressly for public consumption, there is evidence to suggest that Shakespeare never intended for his collection of 154 sonnets to be published. Although written in the 1590s, it wasn't until 1609 that the Shakespeare sonnets were published. Around this time, in Shakespeare's biography, he was finishing his theatrical career in London and moving back to Stratford-upon-Avon to live out his retirement. It is likely that the 1609 publication was unauthorized because the text is riddled with errors and seems to be based on an unfinished draft of the sonnets, possibly obtained by the publisher through illegitimate means. To make things more complicated, a different publisher released another edition of the sonnets in 1640, in which he edited ge the gender of fair youth from he to she. Although each sonnet in the 154 strong collection is a standalone poem, they do interlink to form an overarching narrative. In effect, this is a love story in which the poet pours adoration upon a young man. Later, a woman becomes the object of the poet's desire. 
The two lovers are often used to break down the Shakespeare's sonnets into chunks. The first, the fair youth sonnets. Sonnets from 1 to 126 are addressed to a young man known as the fair youth. Exactly what the relationship is is unclear. Is it a loving friendship or something more? Is the poet's love reciprocated? Or is it simply an infatuation? You can read more about this friendship in the introduction to the fair youth sonnets. The second, the dark lady sonnets. Suddenly between sonnets 127 and 152, a woman enters the story and becomes the poet's muse. She is described as a dark lady with unconventional beauty. This relationship is perhaps even more complex than the fair youth. Despite his infatuation, the poet describes her as evil and like a bad angel. You can read more about this relationship in the introduction to the Dark Lady sonnets. The third, the Greek sonnets. The final two sonnets in the collection, sonnets from 153 and 154, are completely different. The lovers disappear and the poet muses on the Roman myth of Caput. These sonnets act as a conclusion or summing up the themes discussed throughout the sonnets. The literary importance of the sonnet. It is difficult to appreciate today how important Shakespeare's sonnets were. At the time of writing, the Petrarchan sonnet form was extremely popular and predictable. They focused on unobtainable love in a very conventional way, but Shakespeare's sonnets managed to stretch the strictly obeyed conventions of sonnet waiting into new areas. For example, Shakespeare's depiction of love is far from courtly. It is complex, earthy, and sometimes controversial. He plays with gender roles, love and evil are closely intertwined, and he speaks openly about sex. Shakespeare, therefore, paved the way for modern romantic poetry. The sonnets remained relatively unpopular until Romanticism really kicked in during the 19th century. It was then that the Shakespeare sonnets were revisited and their literary importance secured. Luckily, Shakespeare's sonnets were written to a very precise poetic form, and each section, a quatrain of the sonnet, has a purpose. What makes a sonnet such a beautiful, well-crafted poem is the use of imaginary. In just 14 lines, the writer has to communicate their theme through a powerful and enduring image. Shakespeare's sonnets are split into three distinct sections, each with a clear muse. In conclusion, we can say, a chronicle is a historical account of facts and events arranged in chronological order as in a timeline. Many of Shakespeare's plays have historical elements, but only certain plays are categorized as true Shakespeare histories. The Shakespearean histories are biographies of English kings of the previous four centuries. Shakespeare's sonnets are poems that William Shakespeare wrote on a variety of themes. When discussing or referring to Shakespeare's sonnets, it is almost always a reference to the 154 sonnets that were first published all together in a quarter in 1609. The main characters in the sonnets are Poet, Faeus and Dark Lady. The lecture is over. In order to check your understanding, use the following questions. A list of terms is given at the end of the lecture. You are given the list of references for further study.